You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Dr. Carol Dweck and says, no matter what your ability is, effort is what ignites that ability and turns it into accomplishment. Our guest today is a superstar in the health and fitness industry. Nick Shaw is the co-founder of Renaissance Periodization, known as RP, a multi-million dollar health and fitness company that has improved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Through its leading programs, technologies, and team of more than 20 PhDs on staff, RP gives its subscribers an easy-to-follow nutrition plan that fits neatly into your schedule so you can achieve your health and fitness goals. Over the years, the RP team has sold hundreds of thousands of books to help people with their nutrition, training, and recovery, and to help create healthy habits. Nick has also personally coached numerous world-class athletes, including CrossFit Games champions, international weightlifters, UFC fighters, Navy SEALs, and Olympians. Last year, Forbes published a feature story that documented Nick's journey and RP's meteoric rise from a small business into an influential tech company with an industry-leading mobile app available on both Apple and Google. However, tragedy struck in January 2020, when Nick's wife, Laurie, was diagnosed with a particularly aggressive form of breast cancer. Laurie is not just the mother to their two children, but also an instrumental part of the RP business. Shortly after the diagnosis, the COVID pandemic swept the world, forcing the Shaw family to juggle homeschooling, chemotherapy treatments, and navigate the business landscape in the most uncertain time a generation has ever faced. In November 2020, Nick published Fit for Success, a book that outlines the seven foundational habits for achievement to help anyone, irrespective of background, chart their path to success. It also delves into the most valuable takeaways and key lessons from Nick's roller coaster journey to complement the insights gained from working closely with some of the most accomplished individuals on the planet. In this episode, we'll go through the intense personal journey Nick's family experienced in 2020, how he built one of the most qualified nutrition teams on the planet, what the top 1% of performers do differently, the biggest nutrition mistakes people make, how to reclaim your mental power and discard the victim mindset once and for all, and a whole lot more. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one who needs to hear this episode, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Nick Shaw. Nick, always great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Win the Day show. Well, first, thank you so much for having me on. Great to be here. Well, you've been a busy boy. You've had a lot of big things going on in your life. You've got a new book out, your business to go from strength to strength. So I'm looking forward to diving into all of those areas today. I wanted to start off by going back to what success looked like to you as a teenager. What was it that you thought success was when you were a teenager? And when did the possibility of owning your own business first come on your radar? Oh, so success when I was a teenager, man, that's a tough one. I I was really into sports. So it was really more like sports and I guess fitness centric. Although I will say the one thing that I realized pretty early on that has always stuck with me was just the idea. And this is, it's really important in fitness because if you're into fitness, you're into lifting weights, all that good stuff. There's never a place that you kind of arrive at. It's always just, you're just doing it because you like it. It's just, there's always a little bit more you can strive for. You're always trying to achieve a little bit more and you can work really hard. And typically if you work really hard in fitness, the results come with that. And I guess those are two really good things to be sort of drilled in my brain early on. And they've always stuck with me because there's so much similarities between business and fitness that uh, for me, it's always been really cool to see how those two parallel one another. Yeah, it's so good. It's about the journey rather than the, the destination. And you see people who they get so focused on that destination, then before you know it, the rest of their life can be a bit of a mess. Totally. And well, I can give you a great fit, fitness example. A lot of people, they get so stuck on a set number, like, hey, I want to lose 20 pounds. It's like, okay, well, and then they get those 20 pounds and then it's like, then what? Or, you know, they don't sort of develop those good habits because they are so focused on the outcome where it's like, you just kind of focus on setting those good habits, all that good stuff, you know, 
you're probably going to get to an eventual good outcome, but maybe that good outcome is you lose 15 pounds, but you don't have to do anything super crazy at the end. And it's like, well, that's probably a better trade-off. So yeah, it is really interesting to kind of just, um, you know, what, what, what's the term? You just kind of, uh, you, you're basically just, uh, oh, I, of course, I forget the name of it now off the top of my head, of course, but uh, yeah, you're basically, you're just, you just love the process. You just love doing it. And you don't really care what the outcome is. You just love the process of doing it. Yeah, it's so great, all the work that you're doing. And with RP, it's focusing on a, how you can make that a habit rather than trying to reach a certain destination where eventually your whole life falls out of, out of whack all over again. What, what was the gap in the market that you saw for RP? And how were you able to assemble this amazing team of, of PhDs now to help make your vision a reality? Yeah, well, so my my buddy that started RP with me was always a really, really, really smart guy. I met him in college and he went on to get his master's and later he got his PhD in sport physiology, essentially studying like how do you make athletes you know, as best as they can be. And so you really have to start looking at some finer details. And so we started out working with a lot of athletes and you would see some folks that could just skate by with genetics but maybe the stuff that they were doing wasn't really the best. But if you have really good genetics, you can do that. You can skate by. But like if you take someone with really good genetics and then on top of that, you combine an evidence-based program that has the best, best methodology behind it, you get some really crazy outcomes. Think of someone you know, like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. Very genetically gifted, of course, but they're also just tenacious, hard workers. Probably some of the hardest workers of all time. You take that combination really of those two things and you get you know, arguably two of the best athletes of all time. Yeah. So that was really, that's really what we were just trying to combine. It's not like um, we wanted to kind of know the part, uh, kind of be able to talk the talk, know all the studies and all that, the evidence base. But at the same time, we wanted people that also worked out. And if you have just one or the other, that's okay. But if you combine both of them together, then you really have something. So that's really kind of what uh, the, the gap was in the market, you know, about a decade ago. And how many, how many PhDs have you got on staff at the moment? And what is an evidence-based approach to nutrition and training for people who don't know? Probably over 20 PhDs now, uh, you know, seven or eight registered dietitians as well. Um, and, you know, it's really cool now how it works. People will reach out to us that have these great credentials. So we don't really have to do like a lot of recruiting. So if we ever do need coaches, which is, you know, maybe like once or twice a year, people will reach out to us. And it's really cool because we get these people that are just so well qualified. I mean, much more qualified than myself. Like I, I wouldn't be hired now at RB, you know, if, we, <laughs> if, if I were to try now. So I guess that says something good. It's just funny how that, that evolves, I, I suppose, right? It's just, yeah, you that's can spend all your time vetting be. rather than the recruiting side too. Yeah, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, for sure. It is a good problem to have. And, and you know, I, I, you know, I kind of do that, right? I got a little off track with that. So what was the second uh, part of that? Yeah, the, the evidence-based approach. So for people out there who don't really, you know, who mightn't have much of an overview of the nutrition field or training, things like that, yeah. they hear evidence-based approach. But what exactly does that mean in a practical sense? Yeah, well, so you can find just about one study out there that can say pretty much anything, right? And, and so if you only go by one study, you're not going to have, it's just not a great idea. You, you could be really led astray if you only go by that. But an evidence-based approach is more going to look at all the combined evidence out there. You take a look at uh, meta-analyses, you take a look at literature reviews, and these combine hundreds and hundreds of studies. So when you have hundreds of studies and it starts pointing you in one direction, you know that you're probably on the right track. So if you only rely on one study, right, you may be going the right way, but you may also be going completely the opposite way. And so when you pool everything together, it just helps point you in the right direction. That's really what evidence base is about. Yeah, love it. Well, in, in 2015, your wife, Laurie, quit her corporate job where she was kicking some big girls too. She left that corporate job to come and support you at RP. Marriages themselves, I'm married, I know you're married. It's, uh, they can be tough work without the added complexity of working together at the same time. What did you focus on as a collective to make both your business and your marriage a success? Well, so first off, I mean, we were just really struggling in terms of we needed all the help we could get. I mean, you know how it is, just kind of like the one-man business, so to speak, early on. You just have to do everything. And I just simply was like, I need help. I don't even know what it's going to necessarily look like, but I just need the help. And kind of over time, 
uh, what we did because it is, it can be tricky working with a spouse, right? Because I don't want to have to be the person that's like, Hey, do X, Y, Z. Like, I'm not going to do that. And you can't do that with a spouse. Right. So it was more of like, how do we compartmentalize things where you can, cause she's great. Right. She left a fantastic corporate job, super, super smart, incredibly accomplished woman. Like you kind of specialize in what you want to specialize because you're fantastic at doing that. And so that's kind of what led her into doing all of our cookbooks and recipes and all that stuff because she's a phenomenal cook, you know, top notch, you know, very thankful for that, of course. So it's kind of like if she can, you know, have a couple areas that are just sort of all of hers and I don't really have to do too much. That's kind of how we were able to compartmentalize a little bit there. And I think that was uh, hopefully the, the right approach. Yeah, the importance of having that discipline around each other's lanes so you can focus on people having the impact that they want to have without feeling like they're stepping on each other's toes. Is that right? Yes. Uh, that, that's a real good summary because, I mean, you know how it is just in a normal work setting. You know, sometimes you, you kind of have to tell people what to do a little bit here and there. And, you know, if you kind of mix that in with, with a spouse, you know, it can kind of carry over when kind of the quote unquote work day ends. So it can be a little bit of a slippery slope. And that's kind of why we wanted to segment things the best we could yeah well it's a testament to both of your characters that you're still able to create such a successful business and have a great family at the same time so well done on keeping all of that together uh 2020 was a year of enormous transition for the whole world but in january 2020 your family was facing a lot more than the pandemic can you take us into that difficult time for your family and perhaps what your mindset was like when you first got the news about laurie <clears throat> yeah so well first of all i'll say she's doing great now so Nominal news there. Here we are, a little over a year, year and a half later, whatever. Um, yeah, she was diagnosed with aggressive breast cancer. Uh, this was five days before my son's eighth birthday. So that's, hey, that's fun news, right? And then she had surgery in February, in March, she started chemo. And then what happens in March 2020? Uh, COVID, the pandemic, and everything hit. And we had to take it incredibly serious because. You know, she's going through chemo, you know, immune compromise to, you know, the, the, basically the highest degree you can, right? So we had to be really, really careful. And, you know, lo and behold, we're just not the type of people that are going to sit around and sort of let life dictate, you know, what we're going to do. You know, we don't want to sit around and you know, be victims or whatever. So we were just like, well, how do we make the most of this, right? Well, then we focused on things that we can control, right? So you can't control that you have this. Of course, you can't go back in time and fix it or whatever, but what are the handful of things you can do each and every single day that you have control and impact over? And that's what we did. That's what we focused on. I mean, ultimately, that's what led to me writing the book. Because I was like, I'm not going anywhere for the next three or four months. Literally, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, like, I'm going to take this time. I think I have some cool you know, talking points to, to, to put in the book and you know, created the pyramid, the success pyramid. It's, everything kind of just came together from there. Yeah, had you, had you planned the book beforehand or was the book something that you thought, look, you know, you're going through this stuff right now, there are lessons that you've learned, not just from the top 1% of performers, but also the adversity that you were facing in real time that you knew there were so many lessons that you could help share with the world. Was the, the idea for the book at the start or was it when you realized when you were right in the thick of it and I guess the whole world was in the thick of their own struggles at the same time? How did that all unfold for you? Yeah, it was really probably February. I was like, and I think I have these kind of core principles that, you know, whether it's fitness, whether it's business, whether it's overcoming adversity, successful people do these handful of things. And I put together this, you know, rough draft of this pyramid. I showed it to a couple of people. I'm like, hey, am I crazy here? Or am I onto something? And like, well, you're crazy, but that's you know, another topic, right? <laughs> uh, and that's really where it came from. I was like, I'm not going anywhere for a few months. I'm going to be here during quarantine. I'm going to make the most of it. I don't want to just sit back and, you know, kind of wallow in self-pity or anything like that. Like, I think these are valuable lessons that I know are helping me. They're helping my family, but I think they can also help everyone else that is going through COVID during 2020. Yeah, that mental health pandemic behind the scenes, I feel like is the real thing that so many people are struggling with. Uh, I like to try and keep it as raw as possible from that mental health perspective to give people those insights and totally feel free not to answer this question if you don't feel comfortable doing so. But is there a particularly dark day or dark moment that stands out in the last year or two that you can think of? I mean, I think just the day that, you know, my wife found out, because really it's one of these things where you just, my wife is a healthier person than I am, right? And I run a fitness company. 
So that just gives you some perspective as to just how luck, genetics, I don't know, whatever it is can, can play a role there. But you just, you just instantly overnight, it literally just changes everything. And I had been reading all this stuff and kind of had all these ideas in my head. And what I like to tell people is it's entirely different when you're just sort of thinking about these things. And then when you're truly like thrust into having to put them into action every single day, for, you know, months, if not a year on end. And so that was, I mean, really like a turning point where I was like, you know, it is really time to put all of these things into practice. I'd like maybe been doing them a little bit here and there, but like, this is now going, and, and you know, that was even before COVID hit. Then you throw in COVID on top of that. And now it was like this, this complete windfall of things because maybe you could say the second day was March 12th. And funny enough, where we live here in North Carolina, my kids didn't go to school that day because there was like some weird, you know, water boil thing in effect. And I actually was driving my buddy to the airport because he was in town to visit. And like, that's when everything unraveled that day. And I'm just like, holy crap. Like we have all this stuff going on, of course, going through chemo and all that, like that's enough. Now you throw in all this, it was really like, there's no time to kind of mess around and you know feel sorry for yourself. It's like, Again, get back to the things. What can we control? You know, our kids are going to be homeschooled now. What can we do? You know, what are the things that we can do each and every single day that are going to, you know, kind of turn this around so it's not just this really rough year? And I think, you know, knock on wood, I think we were able to, you know, make the make the most of it. Mm. Well, reading books has always been a huge asset for both you and for me. I was telling you offline that all the books and things that you mentioned during your book have always been very influential for me too. And your book is a fantastic read. So people definitely need to go and grab a copy of Fit for Success. What one or two books stand out for you just from your entire life as having contributed to the mindset that you've got today? So the first one that always jumps out at me is called The Slight Edge Principle. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it did not make it in the book. I actually did not read it before I had, you know, my rough draft and everything ready. But this is one of these books, when I read it, it was like, it was, it was a life-changing read. Because nothing in there is new or crazy, but you just, you just, you see that these little incremental things each and every single day, but if you are consistent, you are disciplined with them, they just add up over time and you just get this snowball effect eventually. And that was when I really just started writing down a handful of things. I'm like, I'm just going to do these every single day. I don't care what's going on. I'm just going to make sure that these happen. And, you know, this was probably coming up on about a year or so that when I started doing that and boy, I just think back of you know, how many books have I read since then? Because I just, I make it a habit and you know, I would watch a little bit less TV or, you know, like you, you can make time for stuff. And like, I honestly, I love reading. I don't know about you, but sometimes I actually get really like physically excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I got a new book here. Like I can't wait to read it. Now it just, it kind of depends on what it is, but sometimes that happens. I'm like, oh man, like I can't wait to sit down and read this. Like I know that's a total nerd thing to say, but like, do you get that at all? I do. And I have never, sorry, every single book that I've read has changed my life in some capacity. Every single one. Like if you just get one amazing yes. idea or one insight or one solution to a problem that you've got going on, it can change everything for you. And I guess these days where people have audio books, you can increase the playback speed if you want. I do love a hardcover version of a book, yes. but I, I, do, I do have a better tendency of finishing audio books. But if there's an audio book I really love, then I end up buying the hardcover book because I like having it sit behind me. What, what do you do? You, uh, do audio books or hardcover? What do you prefer? I'm a little bit of both. So I actually have to make a road trip tomorrow. So it's like a five hour drive. I, I was actually really excited because I have, it's like 10 hour audio books. So I know that that's probably going to cover me all the way there and pr probably pretty much all the way back. So, you know, really excited for that. So I do that, you know, if I have road trips or, or something like that, um, I'm, I'm, you know, just a, I like to read books, you know, in, in hand, I can, you know, fold down the pages, make notes, but I, as to what you had said, you, what I try to do when I'm done with, with a book, any book, is I try to write down, like, what is the main thing that I took away from this book? It doesn't have to be, you know, pages and pages of notes. Sometimes I'll kind of, you know, in my phone, I'll, I'll put in some notes if I think something's pretty important. But I try to do, like, all right, what's, what's like the, 
what would the author think is probably one of the most important points here in this book? And I try to just kind of make a list of those. And every now and again, I'll kind of just flip back through it. And so this is a really long winded answer. If we circle back to, you had mentioned two books. The other book that I've really mentioned that I think has really made a big difference for me in terms of my mindset is, uh, is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willing. Jocko Willing. Yep. Yeah. And it's just, when you, when you think about it, it's like anything that happens is, is on you. And when you think about it that way, it's like, I, I don't care if someone five levels below you in an organization, if they mess up, I mean, it's not really their fault if you think about it because who is above them? Who should have taught them? Okay, well now who should have taught them? Who should have taught them? Oh, lo and behold, eventually at the end of the day, it comes back to you. So if mistakes are made, don't blame other people. I hate when people, and this is something that my kids try doing. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not going to blame other people. Now, you know, they're nine and seven. So maybe it'll sink in eventually. Or, you know, maybe I repeat it enough that they do get it. But uh, yeah, it, it's one of these things where, you know, hopefully one day they'll catch themselves and think, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to blame other people. Like, what can I do to fix the issue? So, yeah, I, so I really true. Like that. Yeah, totally love that. There are a lot of people out there who play that victim card, that victim mindset, which greatly, as you mentioned, greatly undermines any ability they have to be able to create whatever circumstances that they want. What do you do from a practical perspective to help get people out of that victim mindset into more of a success or more of a growth mindset? Yeah, really. So this goes back to the, the second principle in my book. It's called internal locus of control. So if you have an external locus of control, you tend to be more of that, that victim mentality of like things are happening to you. There's nothing that you can do. I just, I don't agree with that. I mean, I don't care what your circumstances are. And I definitely understand and have lots of empathy for people that are in bad situations. But if you take that external locus of control, and again, they, they, they've shown this time and time again in all sorts of studies that it just does not lead to good outcomes mm. in terms of your mental health, physical health, all this stuff. So you have to look inside and be like, okay, Whatever's happening, it might be objectively bad, but what can I do about it? There has to be something that I can do. And it, maybe it's really small, but even those really small things starts to put you back on the right track. And if you can do those little things, you probably gain a little bit of momentum, you probably start to feel a little bit better about yourself, you probably become a bit more hopeful because now you know that like what you do really matters and like now you're on the better track. So that's really, I think, just the biggest key. If I had to give one, that would be it, hands down. Mm. And you've worked with UFC fighters, Navy SEALs, Olympic athletes, a whole bunch of different people. What is the common trait that the top 1% of people have and how, uh, how coachable is that trait? They are tenacious, hard workers. And I like to think that I'm a hard worker, but being around some of these folks, so I'm actually uh, you know, driving up tomorrow. My road trip is up to visit you know, Rich Froning. He's kind of like the Michael Jordan of CrossFit. And I mean, this guy would put me to shame as to how just how hard he works and just the amount of work that these people put in. So we mentioned earlier, you know, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan. And it's like that with, with this guy because he trains literally four to five hours a day, pretty much every single day. And you, if you really stop and think about it, you know, if you work out an hour a day, you're doing well. But now multiply that by three or four, and it just, I mean, it's crazy. Not to mention just how disciplined they are. You know, it doesn't matter. They're not always feeling up for it because, you know, they want to be the best. They know what it takes to be the best. They just always put in that work, and it really doesn't matter, you know, how they're feeling. They just do it anyways. Yeah. You can't get away from that, uh, that hard work at the end of the day. You see that people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Sarah Blakely, the most successful entrepreneurs and things on the planet. Um, there's a quote in your book that talks about having that, uh, yeah, being born with talent is not enough if you really want to make a really, really yeah. big impact on the world. And you talk a lot about uh, the importance of self-belief in your book. What role does environment like where you live or, or where you work or the people you hang around play in that uh, self-belief? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely plays a role. And, uh, you know, if you're in a bad environment, it's going to be tougher. The odds are stacked against you. Now, we can acknowledge that, but at the same time, there is things that you can do. Again, this goes back to the inter internal looks of control. I guarantee there's little things that you can do to start to fix that. And now, again, it may be that the odds feel overwhelming against you. 
But then it goes back to, you know, we talked about the book, Slight Edge Principle. Just start doing the little things. And it's going to seem like you're probably not getting anywhere. But if you have a long-term time horizon, and you're prepared to just do these little things each and every single day, you're going to be better off. And I'm not guaranteeing success, of course, because we can't do that. But if you approach it the right way, your odds of sort of beating those circumstances are going to go up exponentially. Yeah, people might feel like they're not achieving the success they want, but have they really had the right plan that's going to give them the best probability of that outcome? Is that right? I mean, that sounds about right to me. Yeah. What about your own process for setting goals personally or for your business? Is there a way that you like, what frequency do you do with that? Is there a certain system or structure that you use to set those goals? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, usually we'll have some, we, we have probably like um, you know, a roadmap of, hey, here's what we need to get done probably in the next couple of years. This is kind of, you know, the, the North Star that we're kind of aiming towards. And that's where we want to kind of end up eventually. We don't know exactly when, but, you know, now we take that and then we start to break that up into chunks where it's like, all right, what's kind of the next step to get us on that track? All right, let's do that. Can we do that in the next month? Can we do that in the next quarter? Here's what we're kind of aiming for. You know, not only that, but, uh, you know, so we have an app in the software development. The cool part is we see the feedback instantly. We have a giant Facebook group. We see the reviews and the app source. Like we know what needs to be fixed. So now it's just putting it on our roadmap and just sort of prioritizing the trade-offs and everything of, all right, well, how can we get this done? When can we get it done? All this stuff. So, I mean, really that plays into the goals on the business side. Um, on the personal side, it really just goes back to, yeah, I mean, I have some goals, of course, and some short terms and some long ones. Usually on like the physical side, I'll kind of need something to sort of train for. Uh, Memorial Day, is there's a workout called Murph. Like that's, you know, that's kind of like my couple month thing that I've been training for, just so I have something, you know, after that, you know, it's like, hey, how fast can I run a mile? Just something, I just need something to kind of guide me on that right track. Because if you don't have any goals, you can just get lost pretty easily. And, you know, what are you doing fitness and workout wise and all that stuff? If you don't have specific goals, it's really easy to, you know, a day goes by, a week goes by, a couple of weeks go by and like you really haven't done all that much. So I really think goals are helpful on, on the business and personal side. Yeah. Your discipline completely wanes if you don't have that, that specific goal in mind. Uh, for entrepreneurs, and you're doing some amazing things with, with RP, continuing to, to take this business from strength to strength, no pun intended, obviously. Uh, for entrepreneurs, the ability to duplicate themselves seems to be the difference between average entrepreneurs who are always on the brink out versus those super high achieving entrepreneurs. What was the biggest step that you took to be able to duplicate your own expertise so you could get the big wins that you wanted from the company and have it continue to grow without hitting a ceiling? Well, I was definitely guilty of what you said, what, what not to do early on. And that's where, you know, we kind of got to the point of burning out because we thought that we had to do everything ourselves. So I'll say one of the biggest things was really realizing that, you know, we know a little bit about a couple things, but there's so much we don't know. So let's bring in some other people. Let's bring in other experts because that's what they specialize in. That's what they're good at because that was really the biggest change. And once we started to do that, and I guess the other thing would be, you know, some, some automation stuff that sort of reduced the time that we had to spend on some of these, you know, minor trivial things. Well, it just really opens up your world to being able to focus on other things. And it just kind of became this you know, snowball effect that once we had more time, we we're able to better focus our efforts elsewhere. And yeah, it's just a great thing to do all around. Yeah, help make you redundant. <laughs> so, you, so you can take some time off if need be. Mm -hmm. Totally, absolutely. Would agree with that 100%. Yeah, one of your principles is talking about recharging, and it's so important when we talk about in terms of fitness, there's that recovery phase, but people who, especially entrepreneurs, very rarely do they take that time off or allow themselves that time to recharge and recover. What does recovery look like in a business sense? Have you ever implemented something like a deload phase or some type of recharge phase for you as an entrepreneur? Well, so if we go back to 2015 and 2016, <clears throat> Our kids were pretty young and if you have kids you understand that's a full-time job small kids like they take up a lot of time and energy so you factor that on of you know trying to train trying to keep up with your fitness stuff and then trying to run a growing business and and we were we were teetering definitely on the point of like just burnout I mean, we had to have sort of just constant help because we were just seemed like we were always just so busy 
uh, busy. And I don't necessarily mean in a great way, but, you know, just busy. We just always had to you know, customer service or just little things like that here and there. And we had to really fix that. And once we were able to fix that, you know, I look back and I kind of think where I've been the last couple of years. And it's like, I have this, and I think this is kind of the, the end goal for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, not that this is an end goal for me, of course, uh, there's always more to achieve and try to strive for, but at the same time, like I just have a lot more flexibility and freedom over my own time where, you know, before this podcast, you know, I, I was picking up my kids from school, you know, at two in the afternoon, I was sitting in the carpool line for literally 30 minutes beforehand. What was I doing? I was reading. You know, it's like you have that freedom. Like that's kind of my downtime. I make sure I have that time every day where I can read and do these things. I make sure, you know, I work out every single day. Because I think the, the thing that entrepreneurs, and I understand, it's, it's a really delicate balance. Because in the beginning, you have to go, 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 if you want to be successful. Like you have to put in that work to, you know, create that initial momentum and success. I get it. Been there, done that. But in the, at the same time, you eventually realize that if you don't take some of that time off and step back a little bit, your output goes down. You're not putting out very high quality work. And if you like, instead of just cramming, you know, the night before and skimping on sleep and all that stuff, if you maybe just got the sleep and you kind of relaxed a little bit, you wake up in the morning and the amount and quality of work that you can now do is better. And it's like, it's a hard thing to learn. And I'm, I did it wrong a million times and probably still do, of course. But once I started to realize that a little bit, I was like, wow, this is, this is you know, where I probably need to try to trend towards. Yeah, so powerful. Well, let's, let's now switch gears and focus on the health and the nutrition side. What are the biggest myths about health and nutrition that need to be busted in, in 2021? Do you have six hours? <laughs> Uh, no, so all right. So we want to talk about, uh, I guess, a couple of main ones. So um, there are some diets out there that I guess they try to capitalize on. So probably a couple of things, really. One would be the idea that carbs are bad. They're not really inherently bad. They're, there's very few foods out there that you could kind of classify as bad, quote unquote bad. Trans fats, okay, probably very, very bad for you. Other than that, it's sort of this balance and moderation thing. And if you understand that, it's kind of this, you know, because people on, on it's, nutrition's crazy. I'm telling you, it's crazy. People love this dogma and they just get in these camps and they're not willing to change their mind or anything. And it's like, no, I'm keto. And if you're not keto, you are a bad person. It's like, okay, okay, thank you. So honestly, if people ask me like, hey, what do you think of keto? What do you think? I'm like, all right, let's talk about the good, all right? What do they do right? Okay, well, great. So if you go low carb, it's probably helpful in that it will make you feel uh, more full because you're eating more you know, proteins, uh, some more fats. You're probably still eating you know, a good amount of veggies. So these are great things. So it's not like carbs are inherently bad. But guess what? Most things that taste really good have a lot of carbs, have a lot of sugar, usually have a lot of fat. Sometimes they'll have, you know, salt in them. Think about, you know, donuts and pizza and ice cream. It's not that carbs are necessarily the fault behind them. It's just that they are very calorically dense, which means they're very easy to overeat because they taste delicious. Our brains are wired that way and we want to keep doing it. And so, I mean, that's probably the biggest one because people kind of like to say that, oh, Calories don't matter. I mean, calories do matter. At the end of the day, it's, it's probably the biggest chunk of the puzzle. But the best way to really control for that stuff and just to be healthy and have like a normal, healthy body weight, eat higher quality foods. And if you do that, you don't have to get crazy restrictive. Follow like the 80-20 rule. And again, if you do that, you eat mostly higher quality foods. I always do air quotes around good foods lean proteins, fruits and veggies, you know, healthy fats, you know, things like nuts, avocados, um, and, you know, healthy carbs, you know, even rice and sweet potatoes. If you eat mostly those things, it is almost impossible to overeat. Yeah, it's such great advice, Nick. And, and I think it's very simple for people to understand, unlike a lot of the other things that are out there. So some of those more of these fad diets and those other things that seem to pop up every year, would they be an example of something that would not be as evidence-based as what you just mentioned there? Is that correct? 
So typically here's how something like that works. You can find some studies on some of these things and the, or you know, maybe there's like some evidence that points towards that they might do something, but people love to extrapolate these things to the nth degree. And they're like, oh, well, you know, if it showed this tiny promise of, of evidence and proof, then, well, obviously that is the, the main thing that you must be doing. And you know, you must map, you, you must fast for 24 hours. Like that is the magic key to everything in the world. And you're like, okay, maybe here's the good thing about fasting. When do most people tend to overeat? Usually it's later on at night, you're out with friends, family, or you're sitting down watching Netflix or whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, a bag of chips is gone before you even realize it. Cause you just, you know, watch two hours of TV. So if you just don't eat earlier in the day and eat most of your food later in the day, that's great. I mean, fasting is great for those people, especially if you struggle overeating at night, well, just eat more of your normal food at night. Like you're covered. There's nothing, again, there's like nothing really magical about fasting. It's just, does it help you stay on track? Does it help you stay more compliant? If the answer is yes, then great. It's an awesome strategy for you. But again, it goes back to these diet camps that people love to get in. And someone's like, oh, well, I did fasting and, you know, had these awesome results. You must do this now. And you're like, well, what if I really like eating breakfast? They're like, no, uh -uh, no, that's stupid. No, nope, it doesn't matter. And you're like, well, don't you kind of have to have some wiggle room in there to kind of meet people where they're at? So that's really, you know, the health and fitness space is just crazy at times, man. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a great point because you need to figure out exactly what the individual actually wants, what are their needs, some other areas yeah. of their background. It's so true. What, what role does exercise play in this? And is there a formula that you can use to help determine uh, what type of exercise should be doing based on them and their goals? There was one thing that you mentioned in your book that I really loved. It's talking about finding an activity you enjoy as a way to achieve your fitness goals. I love nothing more than having a hit of tennis with a really good buddy of mine. We can burn through a whole ton of cows or we can go surf things like that I just I love to do it and it's actually really fun you're not forcing me to go and do something that I hate so as a result you can stay fairly fit by doing some of those endeavors so what type of exercise should people be doing when it comes to, to health goals yeah I mean you nailed it so you know this book is probably more intended to people that are you know into they're not probably like fitness hardcore folks so if I were to have written in this book, you must lift weights and, you know, you must do these things. People are going to look at that advice and be like, that's stupid. You know, like, I don't even like doing that. I don't like being in the gym. You know, if, if someone liked doing tennis and surfing, I would say, hey, that's awesome. Because you can do those things and you can be in really good physical shape because, you know, they're very active and that's a fantastic thing. So, again, really, it's kind of finding what you like to do. Because if you said, hey, Nick, do you want to go play tennis and then go surfing? I'm a big I've played tennis one time in my entire life and I've never surfed. So for me, that's going to be a terrible day. Um, but Hey, I'll meet you in the gym and we can go pump some iron. Like that's kind of my idea of fun. So we just, it were two different things, right? Like you, you like different things. So it'd be silly for me to say, you must do this. Now on the flip side of that, I would say, if you wanted to give some bare bones advice, try to lift weights at least twice a week. It doesn't have to be crazy heavy or anything like that. And then, you know, just try to find some activities that you like, whether it's sports, hiking, you know, all that stuff is great. There's no kind of one thing for every person. It's just, you know, I would suggest the lifting because I just think there's so many benefits around it. But again, you also have to realize not everyone likes it. For example, my sister doesn't really like lifting weights. She prefer to go run. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I, don't, I have no issues with that. I'm not going to tell someone that's mandatory to lift weights, but I think there's, there's a lot of benefits that come from lifting weights, so. You can do it, great. Yeah, for sure. Well, is there any technology or research that's come out in the last year or two that really excites you in terms of human performance? I feel like you could take that one wherever you wherever you want to take it. Is there any? Yeah, any any um, yeah technology or, or research just for human performance more broadly? Um, man, there's just there's a lot of that stuff coming out now. It seems like everyone's kind of focusing on that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm like really amazed by this, but I'm. I find it interesting that people like there's like this rise of home gym stuff and you have things like the mirror or the, or the toenail or stuff. Yeah. Or whatever. We're getting hammered with ads for, 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 for tonal, Dude, yeah. <laughs> you and me both. I, just, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm probably their target market, but I'm getting those every single day. Um, listen, I think something like that would be great for people. And, and here's the thing. A lot of people are scared to go back to the gym and, and all this stuff. Uh, I have a home gym, so it's kind of, 
totally different. I might be, you know, maybe a little skeptical of going back in the gym. I understand that. So I think that's a really cool trend that, you know, Peloton, things like that. I mean, people are able to do these, you know, here's the thing, you connect and you kind of join these online classes and it sort of gives you that sense of community. Uh, for We work with a lot of CrossFitters and the cool thing about CrossFit is they just have this really tight knit community behind them. And, you know, this is something my mom had never worked out for the first, you know, like 60 years of her life. I'm like, hey, mom, why don't you go try CrossFit? I'm like, I'll buy you a membership at the gym that's, you know, 20 minutes away. And she loved it because she could go and she could socialize a little bit. Of course, this is before COVID. It's been a little, you know, tricky kind of get her back in there since. But it's, it's one of these things where you're going to get some lifting in. You're going to get a lot of cardio. Like if, if you're moderately interested in those things, it might be worth checking out. For sure. Well, you mentioned your kids earlier. What, what are you focused on as a parent to ensure your kids grow up motivated, happy, healthy, and, and adaptable? So I consider myself extremely, extremely fortunate. My kids love to read. And I don't know if they got that from me because when my son first, you know, my son could read at like age four. I mean, it was phenomenal. Uh, I don't, I can't take much credit for that. I wish that I could. But, you know, my kids, honestly, like, so my, my wife was out of town. She just took like her first trip since all this COVID stuff and all that. And I took my kids. I'm like, hey, let's go to Target. And I'm like, you can pick out whatever book you want. And like, I knew, I knew they would be excited by that. But also like, they can have a book and they'll sit and read it for like an hour or maybe even longer. And I think that's probably the coolest thing that I could possibly hope for. You know, my son almost has never really played video games and he's like nine. So, you know, just super fortunate about some of that stuff that they love to read. Um, other than that, you know, I try to just make sure that they're, you know, they're active a little bit. So the one thing that actually, so this goes back to the whole control thing. When COVID hit, um, I had them training jujitsu just because I think it's such a good skill to learn, you know, self-defense for life and just builds confidence and all these things. It helps develop that discipline, just sort of being a good person you're going to train jujitsu, chances are you're probably a pretty good person. Because if you're not, you're going to get choked out a lot at, at, at your gym or whatever. Um, so we made it a thing. We tried to train, uh, I'm not going to say every single day, but we tried, We kept training. And um, you know, I just want them to be active. And if they read, uh, man, beyond that, you know, it's, yeah, I think that's a pretty good start. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're doing, it sounds like you're kicking some big goals on the parenting side too. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Let's now move into the win the day rocket round where we ask you 10 questions for some fairly quick answers. You ready for this one, Nick? I'll give it my best effort, yep. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Uh, one by Marcus Aurelius. So you have power over your mind, not outside events. If you realize that, you will find strength. Again, it ties back into the idea of internal looks of control. It doesn't really matter what's happening to you. You get to view it as good or bad, and then you get to view how you respond to it. Powerful stuff. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? I saw this one, man. I don't really do either. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, man, that's going to be a tough one to answer. You're not the um, first. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, I know. Most people find that so weird that uh, you know, I don't really drink coffee. and I don't, know. I don't really drink alcohol either. So. Num number three, what's one bit of advice you'd give your 18-year-old self? Have a longer-term time horizon. Don't uh, you know, delay gratification. Number four, what book do you gift the most? Slight Edge Principle. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Uh, yeah, well, I, so probably used to not really, I realized that there was so much that I didn't know that I was able to bring in more people to help and I think now that's probably been like the best piece of advice because now it's like now we have more people helping and you know i don't have to pretend that i know some stuff yeah it's like the power of the mastermind from thinking grow rich right <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh, number six what's one thing you've learned about failure everyone fails don't be afraid of it just learn from it get better mm -hmm. one of the principles from your uh, from your, your pyramid as well from your book yeah mm -hmm. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, Kobe Bryant. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or business? 
my my phone. I mean, unfortunately, that's where I you know keep all my notes. It's you know where I have most of my apps, you know, mindfulness app, uh, you know, social media, all that stuff. So, you know, it's not a good thing to say, but I think that's by far and away number one. Yeah, if it does the job, why not? Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. I would like to uh, travel and see some, uh, you know, go sightseeing a little bit around the country with uh, with my family. We talked about doing it last year during COVID, like just kind of driving around and stuff. We didn't end up doing it. But uh, yeah, there's just some stuff uh, that I'd like to go see. I think would be pretty cool. And final question, number 10, what's one thing you do to win the day? Read every single day. Yeah, so important. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Nick NRP and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can grab a copy of Nick's new book, Fit for Success on Amazon. Get your health goals on track at rpstrength.com and follow RP on Instagram at rpstrength. Again, all of that will be and more will be linked in the show notes. Nick, always great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me on, man. It was a blast. Honor to be here. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Nick Shaw. He's kicking some very big goals in the nutrition world and has some incredible lessons on how the right plan can help us create whatever circumstances we want. Again, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or a loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. If you enjoyed this episode, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to do me a favor, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Win the Day with James Whitaker is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. Always.